Um, what we're going to do today is a bit of a switch. We have, um, over the last, last several lectures, talked about social justice um, from a religious perspective um, and from a secular perspective. And now we're going to take an engineering perspective on social justice. We did, however, have some things initially about engineering relative to social justice, such as um, the reasons for why we would study social justice in the first place, the idea of inequality of technological capacity and the technological capacity trap. So there's been a number of relevant things from engineering, but now we're going to take an analytical engineering approach. Um, we're going to this week study um, in the three lectures, three subjects. Um, number one, today we'll do distributive justice. Um, number two, we'll, we'll do participatory justice, that's sort of like democracy. And then um, number three, we'll do um, environmental justice. Okay, so those are the, the sequence of um, the three lectures. Uh, so why distributive justice? Why is it important? Uh, so I found this uh, nice little pie chart that sort of illustrates in 2007. I don't think it's much different now. Uh, how um, the distribution of wealth goes in the United States. Um, so the top 1% own 34.6% of wealth in the country. Uh, the top, the next 4% own 27.3%. So in total, you see this plus this, the top 5%, you know, you can add it up yourself, but it's, it's uh, over 50% of the wealth is, help, is owned by the top 5% of people in the United States. Then it goes to the next 5%, next 10%, upper middle, um, 20%. But what's interesting is the, the yellow little slice of pie you hardly see, and that is, is that the bottom 40% own 0.2% of the wealth. Wow. So that shows um, sort of what we already know. It, it knew. Um, when we looked at, you know, we talked about the Gini index for the United States being, um, you know, such as we're, we're quite unequal. Um, you, you, you got a hint at this sort of thing. Um, so the question becomes, is it fair? Okay, and, and that's, that's a very difficult question, okay? People argue about it all the time. It's the cornerstone of the arguments, for instance, against Obamacare, because you know people say it's really, this is a wealth distribution law, okay? Um, okay, yeah, it probably is, okay? So um, some people support that, and some do not. Some people get angry about it, et cetera. So, so, um, you can talk about progressive taxation, you know, why should it be that the wealthy pay a higher percentage of their income, okay? You can talk about locations in the United States that have regressive taxation. That means you tax the poor more, okay? Um, and this starts a lot of fights. <laughs> I mean, this is a tough one, okay? So uh, we're not going to get too much into the, to that kind of stuff, actually. Um, you guys can have your own opinions and fight the battles any way you want. Um, if you look at data like this, though, I tell you on the world, it's even worse um, worldwide, um, you know, with the, the richest holding very huge percentage of all wealth in the world. Um, the question you have to ask is, th I think the question you should ask is things like uh, what John Rawls asked. You know, he, his deep, one of his deepest concerns was, for instance, well, can you really have a democracy in the presence of such inequality? You, you all know the names of the people that buy political campaigns and, and ads and they essentially, you know, via you know, campaign finance, et cetera, you know, control the political process with money and ask if that's fair to you. Okay, because I don't think anybody in this room has that kind of financial <laughs> background to be able to do something like that, okay? So, so it, this becomes a very uh, difficult and contentious issue. It also becomes an issue with respect to the media. I think we all know that the, you know large um, corporations or very rich people own significant parts of the media in the United States, and guess what? They control the message. Okay, and so that's that's a big problem for democracy too, of course. Okay, because one person, one voice simply then doesn't hold. One person, one vote really doesn't hold. Okay, um, and of course that can be quite problematic. Now, so there's many ways to model distributive justice. Um, 
So you can in, in, represent inequalities of all kinds of types in economic, health, education. You can represent distributions and then a redistribution. Distribution is the current state of affairs. A redistribution is the shuffling of things to try to get more equality, for instance, or maybe more inequality. Um, you can represent different notions of inequalities and what to do about them. And you can give ideas about what is just and fair. The field of distributive justice itself is a large field of study. It's, 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 uh, it has been around for a very long time. Okay, um, I like. I don't know if you guys like Dilbert, but I think he's. I think it's a great cartoon. So this is you know Dogbert. So Dogbert's the CEO. I heard 420 times what you make. That means I'm 420 times smarter. The guy on the left, that's a sulk. Okay, the he's the Indian guy, in, working there. Okay, actually it means the system's deeply flawed. If you were 420 times smarter, you wouldn't be contradicting your boss right now. <laughs> so. We laugh, but it's a, uh, well. Okay, so let's get into some details. Um, we're gonna do one type of a model of economic justice and ignore many other things. I'm gonna ignore income and expenditures. I'm just gonna focus on wealth. So wealth is sort of how much you own. It, it, could, it could include things like, uh, I own this computer. Okay, and I, I, I've got my money in my pocket. It could be many of my house, my whatever. Okay, it could, it could include all that. But I'm going to be thinking of taking all of the like capital assets and so forth and converting, liquid, liquidizing them and thinking of everything as money. Okay, that can be passed around. Um, I'm going to assume there's a government um, and a group of humans. And then we're going to have, we're going to call sensing and transfers. I'll illustrate that in a moment. And there's going to be this notion of connectivity or topology uh, or it represents who knows what about money and who does transfers to whom. So let's look at this diagram right here. So I think of this as like the government and these are humans that are interacting with each other. So let's do an example. The humans are the nodes. Uh, the arcs are um, either one of two things. They're transfers of money from, from one person to another, okay? Um, or they could represent also that I can sense how much money you have. So let's do an experiment. Uh, let's play a game. Um, Let's imagine that each of us in this classroom has a, a certain amount of money. Okay, it might be in, let's say it's in our right pocket. We'll think of it as a stack of money. Everybody's got a stack. There's some people in here that have zero. There's some people in here that have a load of money in their pocket, okay? Ask yourself this question. Let's suppose that you are only going, that Tyler will tell Nick how much money he has in his pocket and vice versa. But they're not gonna share it with Courtney. Okay, but Tyler will with Courtney. So I'm gonna create a topology. I wanna have links between the closest people to you. And what that means is, is you'll tell each other how much money you have and you'll pass money back and forth to each other. So you can imagine a graph over the group doing this, okay? Now, uh, here's the question. The question is, is we're gonna have a local policy. A local policy will mean, let's say Tyler has twice as much money as Nick, Tyler says, okay, I'm going to give Nick, you know, a penny, or I'm going to give him a dime, or I'm going to give him something else, okay, or vice versa. Now, the question is, is if I, what class, what type of policy will ensure that if we all start passing money around, we'll end up equalized across the whole room? In other words, money might get transferred from Tyler to Courtney to Aaron to pop, 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 all the way across the room, right? Um, especially if, let's say, this side of the room was rich and that side of the room was poor, the money would diffuse, essentially, right? So the question is, is what does it take in terms of a policy, a local policy, to ensure eventually, as T goes to infinity, that you have equality, okay? Well, let's ignore the fact that we have discrete money, okay? I mean, that's, that's just a detail. You know, we can only go down to a penny, okay, or a dollar, or whatever is the minimum size unit um, owned by people in the class. So, can someone propose a policy that they think will work? This is wealth redistribution, assuming all your wealth is in your pocket. Collect all the money at one place and then distribute. Aha, but you, you violated one of my assumptions I didn't state. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I actually I did state it. Well, I guess so. 
No, I mean, look, I, I don't want to allow something like that because, um, number one, it's completely unrealistic. It's never going to happen in the real world, right? No government can take all the money from all its people and redistribute it. Number two, I wanted to assume that this was distributed. In other words, those two can know each other's money, but nobody else can, including the government or whatever. So I'm assuming no government, and uh, I'm assuming that, that they may, they're the only two that know each other's amounts. I am assuming, however, a connectedness. In other words, there's no one in this room that doesn't have a neighbor, right? Everybody's got a neighbor, at least one. And they're connected to them and will pass money back and forth with them. So they're in the network. So I'm assuming that. So I want you to define, that's a global policy, what you stated. Let's define a local policy. Can you just specify how you'd pass back and forth with Tim? And then make, assume everybody takes the same policy and then will it work? Do you want to know how much money this guy have? Like my neighbor? You can have you can have you can have that information only. So his money plus my money divided by two and we split it equal. Exactly. Good answer. Can everybody see what he said? Just take half the difference. Half the difference and you'll pass no more. Could you be more generous than that? You're only you, you look at his and you you got five you've got ten dollars in your pocket, he's got zero, so you'll give him you say you'll give him up to five bucks. That's what you just said. Yeah. Then you'll be equal. Yes. Could you do could you do a little better than that? And still make a balance? Yeah, probably he he must be passing too, so it it depends on like you can assume that everybody's good, in good faith, passing every once in a while, yes. So I've got another neighbor right next to me, and I'll be communicating with him too, so. Yep. All the, like, take all the money and divide by three. That you can do. You might be able to do something so, like that. That's right. Yeah. In fact, it turns out that you can do an imbalance. You can, you can pass more money to him, but you can't create more imbalance than there was before you started. You do that, you're fine. Let's ask this question. Let's, you know, the religious doctrines have various ideas on this to say things like in Islam, you know, you, you have to give. So let's say you, you, you say, okay, I have to give, but I'm only giving, I don't know any Middle Eastern currency, um, I, I'm only giving a little bit. So ask yourself the question in the United States, if, if we started this process and everybody that had less money than you, you gave them a penny, would it work? Would we get equality? Is there income? No, no, I, I got right here. Okay. Ignore income and expenditures. Because that makes everything harder. The ideas are hard enough without that. Then yes. It will work. Exactly. It will work. The difference between the half case, half the difference case, and this case is what? It'll just take longer. Exactly. It'll take much longer. Okay, so the choice of the poly policy impacts the transient behavior, and it matters significantly because if it's, in, it's, if it's dist redistribution to help someone out that's starving, of course it matters, okay? So generally, the rich want a slow redistribution policy and a not an aggressive redistribution policy, of course. The poor want a fast one, and... Um, they want it to be generous in a sense. They want half the difference, for instance, not one quarter of the difference. Okay? So um, this is the notion of a, of a wealth redistribution policy. Um, and of course, that's a pretty general notion. Um, one of the, the nodes could be the government here. And this, these ideas will still work. Okay? It doesn't matter. It just has to be some kind of entity like a... Um, a bank, you can think of it as a bank. Each of us is a bank holding our own money, etc. So it really will work. These ideas will work in that context. Okay. Now um, this is a very, this is a pretty old engineering idea. It's called load balancing in computer networks. Uh, it's very well studied. Um, what's not very well studied, however, is the, when you add income and expenditures. So this this creates significant complications. So imagine we've got a redistribution policy going on in this room. The money's going up and down, but it's settling out. And then suddenly Katie starts making a lot of money. So she's money's pouring in, but she's looking at Alex and saying, oh, the poor guy, I'm going to hand some of my money to him. So your money will seep across the room as it's coming in. But then somebody else is like a big sink. I'm up here buying 
chocolate almond ice cream and you know um, and, and I'm like a sink for the money and you're, you're a source and, w- and then a lot of people are sources and a lot of people are sinks and then you're trying to rebalance and whoo the dynamics are really really complex right and when the dynamics get really hard really fast but it's important that you understand such dynamics because communities have such complex dynamics well, that's why I'm doing this analysis to help you understand dynamics of communities because our central focus in our class is the community actually that's where we're, we're ultimately getting to in chapter four okay all right let's go on um so what is wealth just to remind you what what uh religions say about wealth distribution charity is big in the islamic and jewish cases they seem to have a bit of a degree of different importance in islamic cases you know, it's stated as one of the five pillars of Islam and it's very much emphasized. The Jewish case, though, too, seems very strong. Um, Catholic social doctrine is, is, uh, is different than the, those two cases. Um, it says that everybody has to contribute to the common good. It talks about this preferential option for the poor as a subset of the universal destination of goods um, and try to change. In the Catholic case, they have a lot of emphasis on trying to not just have charity but to change the structure of the system so it's fair so that's the difference between if you're in a religion and you believe in just charity that means in this case with this network that means you you're just going to give money to each other like this whereas the catholic case says well let's change the rules of the giving let's change the rules to make it a fair system that's what they're they're um they have a lot of emphasis on um and then the secular case, you know, Rawls's difference principle is, is really central to what we were just discussing. I mean, you remember, he said, only inequalities that are allowed are those that are advantageous to the least disadvantaged. Okay, so that's very much about reducing the difference. Okay. Um, and then um, with respect to governments, of course, there's progressive taxation. Um, and regressive taxation and of course you know who deserves what is is highly contested you remember too um, in uh, the UN um, they have the Gini index the measure of uh, inequality with it being zero Gini index of zero means that there's absolute equality in income for instance or wealth Um, whereas it's one there's absolute inequality that means everybody in the country of everybody in the country there's only one person that has all the wealth and it grades between those, those two. So there's a lot of attention given to um, inequality and social justice and numeric measures uh, associated with poverty that also like the, the uh, inequality adjusted human development index, IHDI, and so forth. So, so there's, there's a lot going on in the literature with respect to this whole inequality um, issue. That's why we pay a fair amount of attention to it. Um, so, what I'm going to do, for, I mean, we're going to do a sequence of simulations and analysis. We're going to take a small, poor community, um, and I'm going to assume there's three people in this community. Why? Uh, simply to keep my simulations simpler. Um, and uh, <coughs> I'm going to assume they're making a dollar a day. Um, so if there is suffering, you can save. Remember, we showed that. If you have $25 saved and I have zero dollars saved you look really rich and I look really poor because you've got an awful lot more money than me so inequality is real even in this setting um, so uh, I'm going to assume there's three people and I'm going to assume they want to each maintain $2,500 a day um, in order to pay for a health care bill or something like that um, I'm going to assume they have low spending and they, they, they don't want to suffer I'm going to assume that um, they'll spend more than um, 95 cents a day. I'm going to use the PID controller. I'm going to use everything from the last set of analysis we had done. Okay. Um, these three people are going to be connected. Okay, um, and uh, fully connected. So they're going to look like this. I have persons one, two, and three. Each can transfer money to the other. Each can receive money from the other. We're going to call the money that's transferred a donation by one person to another. We're going to, um, we're, I can donate to someone, I can get a donation. Okay? I'm going to assume that, the, that if I get a donation, it's just raising my income. Remember, I'm making a dollar a day randomly. 
So if somebody gives me a donation, I just got more income that day. It just adds right into my income. But if I give a donation away, that's as if I spent some of the money that I was going to spend on myself or essentially then spending from my own bank. So I'll spend, there'll be times where I'm going to spend money on others. There's going to be a time when they give money um, to me. Now, I'm going to have something I'm going to call a generosity parameter, G. Um, I'll introduce that here in a second. So that, that's my, uh, my setup for these three people. Okay, so I know this is a dense slide, but um, I just wanted to be precise here. So what is going to happen, here's our policy. We need a policy, right? We talk about what a policy means. Well, here's our policy. Each individual in the community is going to look at their wealth. They're going to look at their pocket, let's say. If it's greater than all their neighbor's wealth before spending by anyone that day, then since that individual is the richest of their neighbors, she or he wants to donate some percentage, donated by G, of the difference between their wealth and the poorest person's wealth to the poorest person. Okay? Tyler looks at Nick and I, says, I'm the richest guy. I'm going to take the difference between with the poorest, let's say that's me. His amount of money, my amount of money, subtract some, his amount, subtract my amount, multiply by G, and that money he's gonna to give to me. All right, so I get richer, he gets poorer. Nick's money stays the same. Okay, he just chose to donate to the poorest. Um, if you have other money, you, you, you know, you're gonna spend on yourself, but let me say this. Before Tyler's willing to do that, he's gonna spend money on himself. For that day he's gonna buy himself a plate of food okay and then he'll say eh, I'll give some money all right um, and then the person I'm gonna count just in the accounting of things the person doesn't get that money immediately that day for their dinner they get it the next day all right um, so the question is is what is the value of this G or what does this mean I'm saying it's between 0 and 0.5 well I would say it's just what you said it's, it's 0.5 is the upper limit as a very generous case, okay? And he's gonna, you know, Tyler would give me half the difference, okay? It would make a huge reduction in inequality between us to make that contribution. But what we're gonna do is a little more. We're gonna um, simulate the effects of varying G from zero up to 0.5. G equals zero means nobody's giving anybody anything, okay? G equal 0.5 says all of you people would give half the difference to one neighbor the poorest neighbor. Now see, that's gonna be a pretty fast policy, right? Relatively speaking, it's, it's gonna move pretty fast if you're a G of 0.5. But if you go down in G, like to 0.25, it's gonna be slower, but it's still gonna be effective. And you can see intuitively, this will work. I mean, in other words, this will achieve equality, kind of, all right? The kind of part comes into, I have to say that because of the noise. You'll see in a minute. Okay, so no donations. This is G equals zero. Nobody gives any money, any money. And I do my simulations, I get this. Now let's explain the plots. Um, so the, the, the person um, one is the top row of plots, three plots. And um, this person has um, the, what they spent on themselves, buying themselves food that day. Um, what they donated to buy one in blue, the little B there. And what was donated to one in red? Well, nothing, because nobody's donating anything. And then the error, now remember what the error is. The error is simply the desired wealth minus the actual wealth, okay? So you want that baby to be zero because you want to have saved enough money for your health care. And you can see it's not doing too well. But if you go back to what we had done before, this is what we got. I mean, these are the results we got. These aren't that bad. I mean, look, the person spending down at 95 cents a day many times, but sometimes more when they're making more. And their errors aren't great, but they're kind of okay. You run into this little spike here. So the first row is person one. Second row, person two. Third row, person three. But these people aren't connected. This is not really a community, right? There's no connection between these people whatsoever. They're living independent financial lives completely, okay? Now, we're going to start connecting them up as a community. So we're just going to go to the other end of the spectrum and make G equal 0.5, like obviously I could suggest it. And these are equal people in the sense that they're all making the same amount of money a day, average of a dollar a day. They're all trying to save $25 a day, I have in their pocket. 
And now the situation changes quite a bit. So the first thing to notice is, is that spending on yourself is about the same as the previous slide. That's the left column now, right? Go to the middle column though and ask yourself the question, is one person donating more than the others or receiving more than the others? What do you think? No. I mean, and it's true, trust me, I mean, I can do simulations to show it. No. Well, wait a minute. Now, now we gotta, gotta be careful. Don't forget that fact. Nobody seems to be giving more to anyone else than anybody else, and no one's receiving more from anybody else than anybody else. Is that clear? No. You see, you get the point though, is nobody is suffering because of donating, nobody uh, more than anybody else, and nobody is benefiting more than anybody else, okay? But look, here's a crucial fact in the end though. You say, so it's all so what? But the right column is crucial. Look what happened here in the right column. Look at the error on one, two, and three, they're similar. But just look at one. The error now is, is sitting around here, and look at the maximum time is 8. Most of the time, it's in this range between minus 2 and 4. Remember that, minus 2 and 4. Go back to here and look at the difference. It is a big difference. In other words, somehow, it might be, it's somewhat baffling when you see this the first time. Somehow, even though nobody's benefiting or paying, they're all winning. They're all winning. Because it, they consistently have a lower variance and a better mean here. Here, okay, these are lower. In other words, they're get, doing much better at saving to avoid risk. How in the world is that possible? Do I have an error in my code? No, there's no error. Only reason I know that is because I had two of my graduate students check it. And Tyler checked it. And Universe checked it. And Valerie checked it. And one other person, who am I missing? There's one other person that was in my class. So look, lots of people check this. This works. Why? Somebody tell me why, not you people that know why. Yes? When you say person one's fund deficient, person three still has some money. Yeah. It is set, that's right. So essentially what's going on is, is, is when you're doing bad, other people help you. And when other people are doing bad, they help you. It, it goes back and forth. It's like we're using each other for a, a bank, okay? Uh, it's like a financial service for you to get a loan. It's not really a loan, it's a donation, but essentially it's like a loan because you're gonna give it back at some point. You don't know when, but it's gonna happen. So this is, this is an amazing fact that, that actually, if you're willing to cooperate, even aggressively like this, everybody wins. Now, there's some huge assumptions here. The most crucial one in that makes this work is everybody's equal. Okay, that, that's a crucial assumption. This will not happen if people are not equal. Okay, it, you'll see in a minute. Okay, but in this ideal case, it most certainly happens. And uh, what you're essentially, the way I like to think about it is, is it, 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 essentially what's going on in the random process it is not likely that everybody is going to fail to get a good income on a whole sequence of days, right? Just by simple numbers. That's the crucial issue. Somebody made money today, and we're going to share back and forth. Now, of course, <coughs> another sense in which this falls down is, is that in, um, in uh, some communities, maybe even most communities, what will happen is, is that unemployment will hit the whole region, right? Well, then everybody's incomes are correlated. This is assuming the incomes are not correlated. They're just pure random sequences. Okay, so this is, this is ideal in a number of senses. Okay, but it's still inter interesting that it's, it's sort of a mutual cooperation, mutually beneficial cooperation emerges in such a situation. Any questions? If we reduce G over there, can it lead to accumulation of wealth for everyone? No, there's no mo extra money being put in the system. No, but like, say if, if, if instead of giving away 0.5 of what I have, if I'm giving away 0.25, then I'm saving something for myself, right? Yeah, but nobody's donating as much to you either, though. I mean, 
Look, I'm not studying, the, there's so many cases that can be studied here. For instance, you could have a 0.5 policy with your neighbors, somebody else could have a 0.25 policy with their neighbors, and some could have a zero policy. I'm not studying those cases. But on average, what will happen is what you would expect would happen. Okay, um, now, I want to teach you about, with this plot, about the idea of a Monte Carlo simulation, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, um, Define some axes here. Um, I'm going to start. It's still, it's the top rows, person one, person two, person three, in rows two and three, okay? But the upper left plot is different. You see uh, the horizontal axis, first of all, is G, the percent to give, zero up to 0.5, okay? So keep that in mind. And then on the, on the vertical, um, this is the mean and the standard deviation of the spending on myself. All right? So what does this mean? Go to the zero case. For G equals zero, I'm going to run 100 simulations for 100 people. Okay? And I'm going to find the mean of how much those people spent on themselves and the standard deviation of that. And I'm going to plot that in the left-hand part. Okay? Then I'm going to increment G to this number here, and I'm going to repeat. I'm going to run 100 simulations, 100 different people. I'm going to plot the mean and standard deviation. Okay? It's pretty easy, actually. So you see that as I increase in that upper left plot, G, my spending for person one basically stays, stays the same. Okay? On myself. Which is interesting in its own right. It confirms that you're not hurting yourself by giving money to others, okay? Second of all, and the reason for that is because I'm getting as much donated to me as I'm donating to others, okay? Um, and, then, and then for person two and three, it's the same thing. In other words, their spending isn't hurt by themselves by generosity. Now, the second plot, um, second column plots, um, is, um, well, the blue and the red, well, wait a minute, where's the red, or the blue? It's underneath the red, okay? So that shows that on average, no matter what the G value is, I donate as much as I receive. And in fact, the variances are quite small. It's very consistent, okay? As I turn up G up to 0.5, I donate more and I receive more, okay? But on average, it's the same amount, right? The, the, by far, though, the most interesting case is on the right. So this shows uh, if you take G and you increase it, if you have it zero, you've got actually a high error. We can see that via the previous plots. But once you increase it to here, then to here, by the time you're about the point two, the variance is down and the mean is down. Everything's looking good. So you actually don't need to be as generous as 0.5 to get the benefit. You, because of this long tail like this, once you're up to about here, you've got all your benefit. Okay. So that, that's kind of interesting, but it doesn't matter if you increase it more, as you can see from the other plots. What this teaches you, though, is, is that if you have some generosity in the system, the system will work well. So you, you can sort of see, I, I don't know how, <laughs> you know how good Rawls was, for instance. You know, Rawls never said what percentage, diff the, you know, if there's a distinction between two inequalities, he never said, well, you got to reduce the percentage by this much. He never said that. The Catholic doctrine doesn't say that. Islamic, they don't say that. And maybe they were wise enough to know that if you're reducing it by some reasonable amount, it's going to fix the problem eventually. There is a rate issue, though. Rate issue still matters. Okay, so this is, this is what you call Monte Carlo Run. You, you set up a simulation, and all you do is you put another loop around the outside of it. And you just run it a bunch of times for a bunch of different parameters. It's that easy. Okay? So we're going to be doing this more um, as we move through the class. Um, and these, these kind of uh, simulations and plots um, can give you some really good insight um, without having to like run it, run it again, run it again, run it again, run it again. You go, it seems to be doing this. This, you just say, I'm going to run it a thousand times, a hundred times, whatever, and I'm just going to take averages and see what it does. Okay, it's a quantitative way to, to gain some insight. Okay? Comments? Okay. Now, this plot looks pretty boring, but um, 
So this is the suffering risk plot versus for generosity. So I've got generosity now on my horizontal axes. On my vertical axes in my upper left hand corner, I've got the mean and the standard deviation of the total spend low count. The total spend low count, if you remember, means that's the total number of times the person has spent below, I think it was 0.6. Okay? That's a count of the number of times. And then on the right, it's the total wealth low count, which says, when am I going to be below, I forget what it was, $15 rather than $25. The number of times I'm below $15 over my whole lifetime. And it's interesting because it, it, if you, they're all similar, persons one, two, and three. And um, if you increase G, um, it's interesting because it, those counts, you want those numbers all to be low. Once you increase generosity a little bit, they go down. And, and, and it shows that we are, you are really helping other people, not just in the sense of having adequate wealth, but in also in terms of the number of times somebody will dip too low in spending themselves, on themselves, which makes sense, right? Because if, if someone's really low on money and they can't spend on themselves, their neighbors are all going to give them money by this policy. So you, you significantly reduce the suffering of each other by do, taking this approach, which is sort of just what you'd expect. Okay, so the wealth distribution policy, this has a name, mutually beneficial cooperation, okay? In other words, um, it's not a who wins, who loses. If you enter into this situation, everybody wins, okay? It's not a trick, it's just that it's ideal. All right, you help me, I help you. And a question some people ask is, do you need a doctrine or a law to force this? Not probably not, because everybody's going to want to enter into this agreement of having this kind of wealth distribution policy, because everybody's going to win. The problem comes in, though, in inequality. Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, we could come back to the issue of whether a, a, an app would help here. Um, now, remember we talked about the app in the, the, the financial advising case for a single individual? Well, so what I have in mind here is, is you, you know, we, our phones can all communicate. And the question is, is can we keep track of, you know, donations and, and uh, donations I make to others and my wealth and how would that work out? I mean, using an app, would it, would it uh, you, you be able to look at another individual and say, you know, I'm not donating to them because they haven't donated to donated me in a long time, you know, stuff like that. And, and that would get very complex, I'm sure, to put an app together. Now, let's look at inequality. Inequality matters a lot. So what I'm gonna do is set up to use, I got three unequal people. I'm gonna make, this is, per, again, person one, two, three. I'm um, gonna person one be the rich guy, okay? Dollar twenty-five a day, okay? Significant raise over a dollar a day. Person two and person three are still making a dollar a day. Everybody's trying to save twenty-five dollars a day, okay? Um, and if you look at the upper left plot, and these are of course plots against G on the horizontal, um, the per what's interesting here is that the rich person, the top row, well, as things become more and more generous. That person actually spends less and less on themselves. Okay? So we're starting to run into problems because that person is not so happy with generosity anymore because they're suffering for the generosity. Why? Well, because of the second plot. So what's happening there, the blue, is um, the money that they're donating. So they're donating a lot more money than they're receiving. Okay? As generosity goes up more and more. And they're not being helped with respect to the maintenance of their um, heir um, for um, wealth. And so that first plot is looking like, well, person number one, the rich person, isn't going to be happy, clearly, with the wealth distribution policy here, no matter any of the wealth distribution policies, because between G equals zero all the way up to G equal to 0.5. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at the two um, poorer people, they're almost identical, so let's just look at person two. Uh, as generosity goes up, spending goes up. He's happy, right? As generosity goes up, well, he's getting more donations. But he's giving away money too, which is interesting. All right? Who's he giving the money to? Well, I didn't trace the money dollars exactly, but. 
this guy's going to give to this guy without a question, and this guy's going to give to this guy. Um, clearly, though, these now this guy is still getting donations. If he's getting unlucky and he's gotten really bad sequence of income, the, the poor guys are helping him. Okay, so there is some benefit to the rich guy. Okay, um, but the key is these two plots, right? Poor guy wants to scream it because of these plots, because you know after a certain level of you know, he's able to maintain his, his wealth at his desired wealth um, because he's really, he's getting more money, okay? And the two poor guys are helping each other out too. Okay, so there's, there's lots of reasons why um, they want um, to be in this agreement um, here. Next, if we look at the same situation, but in terms of the suffering and risk um, uh, parameters, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, we saw this in the last plot, but I think the ones that look, these two are about the same. What's interesting here is, is that this is, remember, this is the number of uh, times you've spent very little money on yourself in a day. So you've start, you've been gone hungry that day. And I focused this in, I only went up to G equal 0.25 because it was the same from 0.25 out to 0.5. I wanted to zoom in on that left thing. And so you see that with a little bit of generosity, it goes a long way. It also goes a long way here, too. So in terms of the number of times the, the, the wealth was low. So the rich person isn't being hurt in these two senses or helped, but the, poor, the two poor are being helped without a question. Okay? Now, we're going to change things and make it more unequal yet. So what I'm going to do is take... Uh, um, person one is our rich guy. Uh, these are the two poor guys. Then I'm going to make person one, but I'm going to say this guy wants to save not $25 per day, but $30 a day. Okay? Because he wants to make sure he's more safe, in a sense. And then I'll leave these two take save on um, 25 And then uh, um, you'll see the, the broad, just look at the broad pattern. It, it, it holds. These two columns hold the same, conceptually, you know. Um, blue, the, the, the person one donates a lot, doesn't get much. Gets a lot of donations, doesn't give much. Gets a lot of donations, doesn't give much. On the left top, um, spending goes down. Spending, he's giving the money away, so the spending goes up for the poor guys. This, these guys are like the same as the last plot, but this one's different. So what's happening in this situation is, is showing a very clear case where as the policy is more and more generous, the rich guy is less and less able to meet his savings goals. Okay? So in a sense, you know, he's hurting himself by setting up a high expectation, but in another sense, the policy's hurting, hurting him without a question. Okay. Um, and then these, these plots are about the same. Um, again, not being hurt for the rich guy, but these guys getting help with just the smallest 0.05 in, uh, in generosity parameter. Only 5% of the difference makes a huge difference for these people, okay? Um, so that just shows you how little it takes in terms of generosity to fix something or to help someone a lot avoid um, um, suffering or risk, okay? So, Questions are, who benefits, who pays? Equal people, everybody benefits, nobody pays. Unequal people, the rich guy's paying to some extent, okay? I mean, without a doubt, he's paying. Everybody knows that, that's what's going on, right? The question is, is that fair or not, right? Um, I, think, I think though, you gotta ask yourself the question, the following question, you ask yourself, is all this math and computation worth it? It turns out, I think it is, because it is very hard to think about, for instance, what this, all this is showing you that you don't need very much generosity and you get huge benefit. You can never predict that. I mean, so what I'm saying is, is when the generosity got up to be about 0.2, it didn't need to go 0 0.5, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, all the benefits were there, okay? And, and that's, that's good. I mean, that's nice to hear that that's in fact possible. Um, Next question, will the higher income or richer person um, join or stay in such a community with a policy? 
Um, we're going to begin to address this issue next class period, but you know, it's a valid question. If you live in a society you know, and you think it's unfair to you, will you move? Okay. And in a community like this, you can ask the same question. Will people just move and opt out? Or are you stuck in the community? Some people would feel stuck because their family's living there, their friends are living there, this is home. I won't move, okay? Uh, and they'll play by the game, all right? And they'll help each other out, and, and some of them be very happy to do so. I'm thinking of Antonio in the movie Living on One, right? I mean, you know, he, he, he was an integral part of that community and a very important member in terms of helping people out, okay? Um, he was like the rich guy, right? And I, he seemed very happy to be privileged to be in that position and, and help his, his fellow people out, such as Victor, Victor's wife, um, who had the health problem. Um, so the question you ask, do I need religion or law or both? Is it just culture? Is it values? Is it just family? Is it just friends? You know, I don't know the answer to those questions. I mean, whether, you know, what, what's absolutely needed for these situations, but you know, I, what is true is the religions and the law and the secular perspectives have a lot of similarity on this point. In other words, the, the idea of being generous to the, the poorest is, is throughout everything I've read in social justice. And uh, that's what we're simulating. That's the essential idea we're trying to look, get at. If you help the poorest out, what will happen? Okay? Um, so, you know, these people that might stay in the community, they get intangible benefits like power they might want or recognition or it just feel good to help. Um, so how do you feel, you know, this is also relevant to how you might feel about being rich in technological capacity. I mean, isn't it cool to know the tech and to be the go-to person amongst your friends, you know? They say, hey, you gotta talk to Tim. He knows all about the iPhone or the Android. He'll tell you, you know, people, engineers, typically like to be that go-to person, right? You know who I'm talking about. This, there's people like this, okay? And uh, it, can be, it can be fun, okay? Um, okay, questions. I think the ideas for the day I'd like you to take away but for, to prepare for next time are the following. I want you to remember this network idea. Nodes are people transfers our arcs, okay? And realize that that topology can be very general. A, a topology means pattern. That means pattern of interconnection between people. And if you think about it, we can change the topology and it'll still work in many, many ways. We can take everybody and put them on a line. It'll still work. It will work. It'll be slower, but it'll work. We can put everybody in a circle. It'll still work. There's something called a completely connected topology where everyone is connected to everyone else, like the three-person case, but in this case, it'll still work. This is a neighbor topology that we discussed here in class. It'll work. Second idea, a policy over the topology, okay, that redistributes wealth. And what are the characteristics of that redistribution? What will happen when there is that redistribution? And this is, a, like I said, an old idea in engineering, and it's uh, very well developed but it, it still needs um, further study and research. I mean, you know, PhD level research and figuring out how to cope with this whole issue of income and expenditures at the same time. I mean, way I'm dealing, I am dealing with income and expenditures, right? Because each person is getting input income and expenditures. I just don't know what's gonna happen if I start giving, you know, one person in a network like Katie a raise, a big raise, and how, how will the dynamics go? The Mo Monte Carlo runs, everything else, you know? And, if I'm the big sink, you know, how, how is it all going to work then? I don't know that, okay? Realize, too, that I'm ignoring, uh, there's, I, I go into many details in the book, and I didn't hear. For instance, can you think of what's going to happen with corruption? So, so Tyler and I are supposed to transfer money apart, back and forth, and I say, oh, really, Tyler, I have nothing in my pocket. <laughs> and then really, it's in my back pocket, okay? <laughs> you know, and he starts giving me money. Okay, I believe you. Start giving me money. Corruption works in this system. Why do you think people hide assets when it comes tax time? Or when you do your, what, what is it, FAFSA? <laughs> Why do you think people hide assets? Okay, that's a type of corruption. So this kind of stuff is most certainly going on. Um, and you know, those are, those are very difficult issues um, really to deal with. We, they're easy to simulate though, 
I mean, all, all that's real easy to simulate what the effects of that are. Um, now, so you have a policy, you have redistribution dynamics, as we would call them, across the community, and then we can do simulations, but you, um, we can look at dynamics of things, variables moving around, we can study and understand their behavior. But then the idea of the Monte Carlo simulation, I really want you to get that because we're going to be using it throughout the rest of the class. And that is, it's simply, Monte Carlo uh, was, uses a term because it's, it's a gambling location in Europe. Um, so it's, it's, it means randomness. So you just, you take a simulation that runs randomly, this one does of course, because in comes a random stream, and you just repeat runs and take mins, or, I'm sorry, means and standard deviations. That's all there is to it, okay? If you wanna know how to do that with the code, of course, you know, look at the code that generated this. Um, what, it, what is happening here is there's a, a simulink diagram and you call that diagram to run a lifetime for the community and you get the data back from it and then you just repeat changing the, the G value as you go. That's all the code does. It's, it's actually quite easy, okay? Um, so, so Monte Carlo runs. Now, let me say where we're going because I want, I want uh, to prepare you. Next question is gonna be, what's the relevance of democracy? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna define a democracy and the democracy is gonna do a simple thing. It's simply gonna vote on whether to increase or decrease G, the generosity. So one person will say, you know, like if I'm a really poor person, I might say, increase generosity, increase generosity. But if you're a rich person, you're gonna say, decrease generosity, decrease generosity. And we're all gonna vote, and we're gonna see what emerges. Will we get generosity? Will it converge or not? So we're adding on voting. This is like adding on the voting of tax rates in a, in a country, okay? But it's only gonna be for three people, okay, again because we can study a lot with just three people. And yet we're gonna have democracy like added on top, okay? And we'll vote on the wealth distribution policy and we'll see what happens, okay? Um, and some, some actually some very cool things come out for, for the, the democratic case. Um, and you, you'll, you'll start to see why it is that people like John Rawls says, I mean, the only fair system is a democratic system. I mean, you know, that's been learned, many, many countries have learned that. Um, not all, of course, there's, there's plenty of counterexamples. And, uh, and then there's different levels of democracy in, in terms of the quality of implementation of the democracy, without a question, okay? But nonetheless, it, it, there's a broad agreement um, about the system ought to be democratic in the world today. There's, there's many people feel very, I mean, people die over this issue, okay? So, so there's many people that feel this way. Um, so we'll, we'll look at an analysis of that um, next class period. Any questions? All right, we'll see you on Wednesday.